Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome everybody to our third series of oil and gas related webinars from Andrews and Hauser. Today we'll be discussing engaging and overall prevention systems in oil and gas. The speakers of today will be Volker Schultz, and he's a business development um, manager in our production center for Level and Pressure, located in Moburg, Germany. And the other speaker is Marcus Wolkemuth, and he is speaking from my headquarters in Reinach, Switzerland. Both are very experienced and look forward to any questions you have at the end as well. So uh, please don't hesitate if you have any. This webinar will last uh, roughly about 45 minutes in presentations, and then we have some questions and answer time uh, left as well. As is very common in the oil and gas industry, we will have a small safety moment before we start any activity. And today, of course, I would like to focus on the current COVID-19 situation. It's getting better all the time. But please wash your hands on a regular basis, keep at least six feet or 1.8 meters distance from each other, wear a mask in public, get vaccinated when you get the opportunity and make sure you stay in good mental health. And I learned yesterday there was a big uh, vaccination uh, tent set up in our production facility in level and pressure and uh, most of our employees went there. My name is Rob Vermeulen and I'm globally responsible for the development of oil and gas uh, within the Anderson House organization and I reside in our campus in Greenwood, Indiana in America. So before we start, small introduction of Anderson Hauser as a company. Uh, we employ roughly about 14,000 people uh, worldwide and we have production centers on all the continents. This to make sure that we can deliver fast and are very close to our customers within industries and uh, from a, a global perspective as well. We're very innovative. <laughs> we have over 8,300 uh, patents uh, just on measurement equipment alone. And uh, we are very proud of that as well. We're financially very healthy. We're a Swiss organization. And with this, uh, I'd like to hand over to Matthias, who's going to introduce some a little bit more uh, of Volker and the installation he is standing in as well. Go ahead, Matthias. Yes, thank you, Rob, and welcome to Andres and Hauser Level and Sorry, my headset was not working. Um, yeah, welcome to Anderson Hauser Malburg in uh, Level and Pressure in Malburg in Germany. Um, well, today my job is to support Volker. I'm actually a business development manager for oil and gas. And Volker and myself had the feeling that we see a lot of home office these days um, when we talk to other people or when we see online seminars. So we felt like it's time to bring that stuff back into the factory. So what you see in the background is really no fake. This is the original facility here in Marburg. Um, and yeah, we are actually the competence center for level and pressure as well as for tank gauging solutions and inventory management solutions within the Anderson Hauser Group. And we are actually on this campus here. So this is our factory for level devices, for example. And Volker and myself, we are sitting uh, standing somewhere in these basements of the buildings back there. And the, all these basements of those buildings are the so-called test center where we do all the typical testing, EMV tests, IEC tests, IP tests, all that stuff is done here. And behind me, we typically do our application tests. This is our application validation center. So here we are very close to real customer applications and try to uh, to do this as close as possible to reality to show our devices um, the reality later on in the processes. So what you see in the back is kind of the first customer for us in R&D when we develop new products. We also do a lot of trainings here for service people, for sales people, but also for customers. And we also test a lot of tank gauging devices, tank gauging systems, IMS systems. And this is actually the the hint for me to hand over to Volker because he's the expert for all this and he will now tell you all the details about tank gauging. So Volker, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Americas, and good afternoon, Europe. So it's my pleasure today. I take off my hat uh, to present to you the overview about our tank gauging solution. So to select the right technology for sure. But at the end, 
you will not always have the time to look at me. So we have a web page for Anderson Hauser under oil and gas where you can see based on your application here in the refinery, typical application examples. Like if you select a cone roof tank, then you will be informed what are the instruments you could select there from us. And we have the sound off again. I don't hear anything. We can hear you very well, uh, uh, Volker. Okay, no problem. Fantastic. Yeah, I now I hear. Sorry. Yeah. Good. And what kind of overflow prevention we you can use? And later, Marcus will talk about it. For sure, we have wireless communication, and then this information goes to the system. Now, to have a better idea, everything in tank gauging is measured to a reference. Typical here, the level tape which you measure from the top of the tank down, either to the bottom of the product or just to the alleged level, and yeah, inage levels. Good. Why do we measure actually accurate? Now, just take this numbers here, a level uncertainty of two millimeters will give a certain amount of uncertainty in liters or gallons. And so, even a temperature uncertainty when you measure of 0.2 degrees or 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit would be 560 gallons. And the same is with a density measurement when you do mass measurement. For sure, each of the tanks has a strapping cable, also that has a certain uncertainty allowed and everything is a reference to a defined position, the gauge reference height. And from there, you measure down to the tank bottom. And this can change with the filling of the tank. Then you have a hydrostatic deformation. You can look at me. If I drink too much water, my belly comes out. I eat too much. If I look the other way around, then I get slimmer. Now, for sure, tank shell expansion is happening. So all this is, can be moving. Many times in my hometown and also where Rob, my colleague is coming from in the Netherlands, the base is moving. So because of the tide and the flood. So you have to really correct for this or sometimes in several applications. Roof flexing, we have seen this very frequently and then vapor influences. And yeah, as many application goes for floating roof, measurement there. This means have a compensation of degassing. Even a floating roof position can change the level measurement. So people start to measure that more accurately. But why do we talk about accuracy? Well, first of all, if you measure something, you want to trade it. So it's the internal accounting, inventory control accuracy requirement, like under the reference condition, plus minus three millimeter, or if it's for custody transfer or trading under references sensor is plus minus one millimeter. In reality, it's allowed plus minus four. And now you will understand why people want it more accurate because from plus minus one to plus minus four millimeters in the installation, this is a big difference. Interesting is that the inventory control and custody transfer accuracy for temperature are the same. This means within the application, the temperature accuracy should be plus minus 0 0.5 degrees C. So you have to really good measure this one and have a good tape at the different position to compare that one. Now, from Anderson Hauser, when we develop our first tank gauging radar system in 2001, we came out with the concept to have the radar tank gauging on EXIA installed. And then a temperature probe connected via hard communication and pressure devices. And the tank side monitor, as it here is, you can still see it here on our plant directly. This is how he actually looks. And additionally, we added to the application now an EXD radar. This means 
everything into one place where you connect on the top of the tank, the temperature probe and the pressure device. And just to remind you, this concept of EXIA tank gauging means we connect any level device from the top of the tank with the power and read out the readings like level. And then we connect here pressure devices on the tank bottom to measure observed density, for instance. Or we could measure the observed density directly with three pressure devices there when we have had pressure. Now, this is the first layer of observed density calculation. And then we go into the correction later into the system to come to a reference density. Important for the many customers, how do we transmit the data from this device? And this is standardized because we can either go Modbus communication, even in redundant mode. Here we have a wireless options available. We have a long distance protocol called V1 communication, which goes up to 6.8 kilometers cable, or we use 4 to 20 signal with superimposed hard communication. And even here, we offer our wireless solution. Now, this tank gauging system is cell 2 approved to IEC 65008, so 4 to 20 output, relay min or max. If you have a 4 to 20 input signal, you can retransmit it as a safety signal. If it's a hard information, it's not a safety relevant data. Be aware of that. Good. Now that means we have radar technology for dome roof tanks, for EXD application, and EXIA devices connected to the system, or ceiling well application, EXD, and EXIA. Now, you see here different frequencies of the radar devices. And one reason why we use 80 gigahertz technology is because we wanted to reduce the size of the antenna so that the device can be closely mounted to the tank wall. So just now you hear the tank wall because I wear today safety devices, I dare to do this. This device is very closely mounted to the tank wall. And these are the application where the 80 gigahertz radar is the best in the application because it can be mounted close to the tank wall, typically where you install before a floating tape. Also, when there are heating coils below, they're sometimes in the block way of your radar signal if your beam angle is too big. This was one of the customer, so you could not measure very low. And there we installed the 80 gigahertz devices in the UAE, and we were able to measure up to the tank bottom of one centimeters. The customer was absolutely amazed and changed on the spot all his EXI radar devices because you really want to measure that low. For sure, we could have installed a server for this application to handle that, but this was heavy crude oil. So it was pretty sticky. The maintenance at the end of the server would have been a little bit too much. So we used radar technology. Good. So in every application, as I mentioned before, we have temperature probes, connected average temperature sensors. We have two different ones. One is going up to six spot sensors, and the other one is up to 16 spot sensors with the right approval for the custody transfer. Now, these are the devices today, and I'm very glad to announce that we will change by end of June and add a new device to our portfolio, the new temperature probe, again up to 100 meters, but this time we will have 24 spot sensors in four wire RTD functionalities. And each of the devices, even the temperature, can be now in stainless steel. And the accuracy class is the best in the world. 
with this one. So there's nobody better on this functionality. So we are really looking forward to help you even better with the calculation here. What is unique about this device? We have this aluminum housing or stainless steel, but we are able to run 12 spot sensors in redundant mode. Now you will ask yourself, okay, why do I need redundant sensors? Well, very easy. Now these devices are hanging in the tank for 10 years, five years before they get maintained or cleaned up or repaired. And if in the meantime, one of your RTD fails, you would take it out of the calculation and you would not have at that level the right information about the temperature. So your uncertainty will increase depending on the temperature difference from the bottom to the top in the tank. And that could mean you will lose money because you cannot really calculate the mass at the end accurately or the volume. Therefore, we have the option for redundant sensors. And yes, because Rob is there, in his country and in his neighbor country, the tanks are getting higher than 30 meters, 40 meters for the storage. So we need more points to really measure at this tank accurately and build up a profile. And this device has a pressure rating up to six bar. So be aware of that. This is released end of the month. And with this, we really complete the upgrading of our tank gauging devices to the latest functionalities. Now, all these devices are talking to a system later. But don't forget, we have a servo technology at hand. Not everywhere radar will work. And some people also want to monitor the quality of the product. Now, servo technology typically goes up to 36 meters here with, an, um, with a standard device aluminum, or we have a stainless steel version up to 40 or 55 meters. I already have seen for deep wells or underground tanks, 155 meters for these devices. But the accuracy is very amazing. And the signal from this device are again that you measure the level to interfaces, it means the motion layers. You can measure the density and you cannot measure the density at 16 points. Now this one measures up to 50 density points. And this really gives you a quality control of your product when you need it, even at lower level. Because if you're using an HDMS calculation, means a level and a pressure device, you need certain product level above the product pressure sensor so that you achieve the accuracy which the servo is making, roughly four meters. And then the signal will go again the same way like the radar, the tank side monitor, the servo has the same connection principle and the same hardware, electronic hardware inside. So it's the same spare part concept. Now, this is the calibration report from our servo. We have a 40 meters tower in Japan to calibrate this device really. So it's a little bit tough for me to go up and down. So specifically for me, they build up some air supply on the way up and down so that I can breathe good air, but just, just for fun. Now with these devices, and typically also we have float and tape up devices, we then are very relaxed what kind of application you have for the measurement. And we can easily connect these devices up to our system. Also here, the tank vision system is really unique in the market. It is embedded calculation in a box for 15 tanks, including the web visualization and the license. So you will not lose the license key because it's inside the hardware. Many times we, our customers called us, we lost the license key, the USB key for instance, and it was not protected. Can we have a new one? 
treatment. So is it really lost or is it just used for something else? Good. Now, when we are at many sites, we see these kind of devices. And so we have to think how we bring the old devices, which are installed and still working, into our system. And therefore, we link our friendly competition devices via a gauge emulator to Modbus and bring it into our tank vision system. And from there, we can bring the data via host link with Modbus TCP or ISOID 5 to the DCS. And on this network, we will have dedicated PCs which can access the web browser because we really want to make it secure. We don't want the shutdown of the system there. Now, if we do that with our devices, we can link them with the gauge emulator into a Entis system or a SAP system. Nowadays, this is Honeywell and Amazon. But for sure, we have this gauge emulator also for the cabinet, where we then can convert their protocols into Modbus or from BPM also to Modbus and bring it into our embedded solution. And with this interface, we offer the functionality that you can still use your old configuration tool via the dedicated communication protocol. And the Sennhauser is using a standard field care solution. This works for any kind of devices in the world which support FTT DDM technology. And as I mentioned before, we have two options to bring the data from the devices wireless. Modbus wireless or hard wireless. And that's what we normally would use there. So it's a purely question of how well is the network designed and how many repeaters you need for this network. Now, as I mentioned before, we have a dedicated interface for a DCS, like Modbus communication. We also have a dedicated interface if we have many tank vision boxes to bring them into one web browser and this is just a data concentrator. But for sure, in many sites, we are asked for a PC-based calculation tool. And we have that one. That can then also talk to a redundant interface and select the first good in signal from the interface, or can be fully in redundant mode. And if we are really going redundant, I want to typically eliminate the single point of failure. In this case, still the network here below is non-redundant. I would make that redundant. And then many sites in India especially have already for LPG the requirement of a servo device, a radar device, and a vibration fork independently for safety for the application because they don't want a single point of failure and make it highly available for the safety application. Now, what is the most important for you at the end? You have to maintain the devices. So it should be easy. You should have not special tool and go to the site and realize, ooh, what's wrong? Therefore, in Anderson Hauser, the operation is always locally seen on a display and you can see the same information remotely and it's very clearly shown. Now, for those who look very clearly, even here in our tank center, one of these devices is in red, and it's, when we look at the details, it would be now a simulation because we are simulating faults for our asset management software there. But that is something which you would not see if it not comes directly from the device, or so you would see this in the control room this information. So it means all the tank gauging devices are talking via the tank scanner to our field care software so that we remotely can see the configuration, support our customer, look at the gauge operation if we have to give commands, diagnostic, how many times it moved up and down, if they are built up on the antenna, and we can do still proof testing, which is a very important feature when your device is used in a SIL application. 
because then we can use with our safe failure fraction of 98% our proof testing capabilities so that we can see how much we could test in the application and when you have to retest it again. And our proof testing capabilities are extremely high, which really supports our safety design. Good. And yeah, if there's a troubleshooting requirement, typically we have today the field expert. It's an XPC, which you can use via the network or locally with a hard communication and have the field gather installed. It's automatically fully installed and then have access to the devices and the history and the upload and download functionality. And we are currently connecting this into our cloud solution with Natalian. And from there, we are able to support you remotely when you give us the access to the site. Because most important is that we don't have access to it when the plant is running, because nobody should disturb your operation. Good. This is based on the site installation. And yes, we provide the data not only to business system like ERP or SAP or JD Edwards, we also can provide this information to our supply chain software. But that would be another topic for a presentation. Good. Now, I'm actually finished with my part of the presentation. And I now have to look if Markus is there. Markus? Yes, I'm now, back, Volker. That's fantastic. Now, Markus is a Swiss guy. And what does a Swiss guy always must have? A Swiss knife. Well, I have a Swiss knife in blue, but as he is a Swiss guy, where's your Swiss knife? I have my Swiss Army knife in red, obviously always with me to be prepared for any circumstances and be always on the safe side. Good. So, Marcus, I will hand over to you now. Thank you, Volker. And um, Thank you. just to, to go on with the topic safety, as you see, um, the, the Swiss Army knife is to be safe, to, to be prepared for any incident. Uh, and I would like to speak a little bit about overfill, overfill prevention on tank farms. As you may know, the most critical event that you can have in any tank farm is an overfill event. So when you overfill a tank, this can be um, a, a big disaster, a big issue. You may know issues um, from the past, like the Bonsfield issue in the UK or in, in other sites, also an overfill of a tank have lead to, to big explosion, to big damage. And this will follow not only uh, by losing a lot of your assets, but also with big fines. So a no fill event can be uh, a, a huge um, problem, uh, which you want to uh, avoid on all circumstances. But as you see on the pictures, um, it's not only the big events where you have explosions, where you have a fire, also small events, whenever you overfill, whenever you spill oil, you have um, to clean up, you have to, to uh, report it, you have some issues which cost a lot of money that you want to avoid. And this is not a rare event, so small spills or spills at all, uh, they happen daily around the world. There are about uh, 100,000 spills reported each year worldwide. So that's not something that, that um, you should say that will never happen to me. This is quite common that you face some issues. And when you look at the statistics, uh, in around 3,000, 3 to 4,000 filling operations, you would face, according to statistics, about a, a, a novel fill in, in 10 years. So this is a topic that uh, a lot of people care about. And we decided in Anderson Hauser to provide what we call a solution package to solve this issue on overfilling a tank. And uh, when we go to the next slide, you see that we, with this solution package, we combine the sensor, the Anderson Hauser sensor with a system and uh, with some um, services and, and functionality. So Volker, can you jump to the next slide, please, for me?
Thank you. So here you see um, on the left side, you see the tank gauging system. That's what uh, Volker was talking about the last uh, few minutes, where you see the tank gauging system with the radar, with the temperature sensor, uh, with the gauge emulator and everything. And on the right side, you see the overfill prevention system. And according to the regulations that uh, were, um, were put in place after incidents like the Bonsfield incidents or other incidents, this system has to be completely separate to any tank gauging system, and it should be also diverse. So what does this mean? Independent is clear, you need to have a separate sensor, a separate system, a log logic solver, which is independent from your tank gauging system, and a way to stop your inlet flow. You see on the picture, we have a, a, a point level um, is our preferred sensor, going to the overfill prevention system, to the cabinet. And then when we detect a high level, a high, high level, basically an alarm, we shut down the valve or the pump, or we give you an alarm, a visual or audible alarm that you can stop the inlet flow. Why do we prefer um, point level sensors? That's diversity. So we want to uh, use a technology that's completely different to radar or to pro servo technology just to avoid some common cause errors to be on the safe side in case the radar or the pro servo or, or the other measurement device does not detect a high level the chances are bigger to when you have a, a, a diverse instrument a separate instrument with a different measurement technology that this technology detects the high level alarm so it should be diverse and it should be independent. And as you can imagine, or it's logical that this overfill prevention system is a safety system. Whenever you, you want to prevent incidents, you have a safety system. And with any safety system, you have to check the functionality. So you do two so-called proof tests. So you have in a regular basis, you have to check if in the case of a high, high level on your tank, the valve will close or the pump would stop. This you do once a year or twice a year, or some companies even do it uh, before every filling operation. You want to make sure that the system works according to its design. And this, when you do this in a manual way, in, 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 a, in a completely manual way, this can be a lot of effort. Then you would go normally on, you climb the tank on top of the tank, you take your sensor out of the tank, you put it on a, in a bucket of water or oil and see if your final element would switch and then you put it back on. This is on one side a lot of effort to do. On the other side, you also uh, include some risks because by taking out the sensor and putting it back, you may even destroy the cabling or destroy parts of the sensor without noticing when you have done or destroyed it after the test. So this, um, according to API, you should avoid. You should um, do this testing without the need to remove the sensor and also without the need to increase the level of your tank to a critical level. So you don't want to increase uh, the amount in the tank to a level where the high level switch uh, would go off. And that's why we implemented a, a proof testing functionality in our system. Um, with our tuning fork point level, you know this tuning fork, there's a vibrating fork, always vibrating. And when you sense the high level, this vibration frequency will change. And this we use to also make sure that uh, we can prove that this sensor always is working. So for me, we, I call this sometimes also as a continuous level measurement because it's continuously vibrating. So we need all, we know all the time that this sensor is still in good health. If this frequency, this this uh, this frequency is changing, even if the level is not high, we know that something is wrong. Can alarm, and this changing frequency or this this um, this uh, functionality we use also for our proof test. So our system, you with with the system, you can start a proof test, which is checking the sensor. So we check that the sensor is still in good health and, and, and works when it's needed. But we also check the uh, system itself. We check the control system to make sure that um, 
the, 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 the logic solver is in good shape, the power supply is still there. You may have uninterrupted power supply included where we check the battery lifetime or the battery capacity. You may have uh, redundant power supplies we check. We check the input and output of the system and also we get the feedback from the final elements. This can be from, from the alarm horn or the alarm lamp, some feedback to know that they are still working, that everything is fine or the feedback from the pump or from a valve to know that the pump and valve has moved when we switch it off. And this proof test is designed in a way that uh, you can do it for, for example, for 16 tanks, such a proof test will take about five minutes. So this allows you to do the proof test whenever you want before each filling operation every day, whatever, without big hassles, without big costs. The other part that's important, we designed the system in according to API 2350 and also in accordance with the regulations that came out with this bonds field report. And we uh, took an external company, a safety company, uh, to audit our system and to do uh, a type approval on the system to make sure that the system is rated to according to the seal rating that we have. And that we fulfill all the requirements from API 2350 and also from the bonds field report. So this way we can ensure very easy that you can install the system with the right sensor and reach up to seal level seal three. And uh, this you can do without big engineering. It's all pre-engineered, all finished when it comes on site. You just install the cabinet, you connect the sensor, you connect your final element, your valve, your pump or your alarm lamp and then you can start with the first proof test and the system is ready to go. So when we go to the next slide, you see that obviously there are um, many different installations where you also may need some different sensors. So of course we prefer the point level, the tuning fork, but sometimes you have to have a radar or some other devices and the system is designed in a way that we are flexible enough to also mount uh, other sensors if they are needed. And also on the bottom, you see this, this uh, round um, sensor that we have. This is a, a, a leakage detection sensor, basically. It sits on in the pump sump on your tank farm, and it will detect any small oil layer on top of the water in your pump sump. And this way you can detect also leaks that happen maybe not from overfilling, but from, from a leak from a flange or from a valve going into your pump sump and you can very early detect that and uh, um, do some counter measurements. <clears throat> when we go to the next slide, you see some of these applications. So we have to design the system to meet more or less any tank shape, any tank uh, setup, but also like you see on the bottom left side, when we are talking about filling a tank, there are many different options. For example, you fill the tank from a ship uh, and there often you have a pump on the ship and then uh, according to your risk assessment you will do, it's maybe not enough to just shut down the valve on the tank. You need also information going to the ship that the ship can stop the pump and maybe you also want to, to, to shut down or close a valve on your jetty. And the system is flexible enough to also handle these use cases that you can uh, give the signals to, to other operations, to, to other systems and shut down the flow in a controlled way. When we go to the next slide, you see that um, we have several installations in place. Here you see some use cases. And one of the use cases is from Fujaira, where we have also a success story on a video and on, on, on paper that you can watch um, where we have installed the system. And there basically the customer said that the, the main advantage for him by side saving um, money in, in, uh, in insurance costs because you can prove that there is a, a safe system and by side the efficiency that you gain with the proof testing functionality this customer said, look, it's for us, it's very important to do the promotion to be the safest tank farm in the region. That's how they try to attract new customers to say, look, when you store your material in our tank farm, we can ensure that you don't end up in the news 
uh, with overspills or with, with uh, pollution on the environment. So that's their marketing message to their customers to say we are the safest place to store your product. And that's what we try to achieve to on one side save money with insurance and, and, and efficiency. But on the other side, we want to make sure that you as our customer can also um, make your product, your tank farm more attract attractive to your customers. On the next slide, you find some, some links that you have in the handout. Obviously, there's one link to the endless.com homepage where you find all the information, also technical information on this overfill prevention system. Second link is a very interesting guidebook. So we have uh, um, written a guidebook on overfill prevention and tank aging, which uh, defines or, or speaks about a lot of um, a lot of uh, regulation topics, a lot of use cases, different ways how you can uh, make sure that the overfill prevention uh, is done in the right way. And there we also um, show a little bit the overfill prevention process, how you come from when you want to implement um, safety overfill prevention system, what are the steps? That's not done by just ordering an overfill prevention system. There are many steps from risk assessment to uh, maybe analyzing your um, installed base to designing the, the, the right seal level or the right uh, levels also on the tank to then installing the tank for the, the overfill prevention system and at the end to do the maintenance and do the, the, the seal audit or the seal calculations. So there you find in this guidebook a lot of uh, detailed information how this can be done. Um, then we have also three videos linked on, on this page. One is uh, from our system where you can see how this proof test of 16 tanks uh, would typically work, how you do a printout of your um, results on such a proof test and how this, um, what steps are involved there. Then we have a link to the video filling blind. That's a, a, a very interesting video showing what can happen when you overfill a tank and you show very impressive. You see there um, how fast within minutes you will end up from an overfilling a tank to a big explosion. And the final video is what I said, the uh, use case, the, the success story from Fujaira, where we have a, a nice interview from the customer, why he uses this system and why he's convinced that's the right system to use and what are his benefits. So this in a short um, summary is what we do on overfill prevention, how we make sure that you have a safe uh, a safe uh, tank farm or a safe uh, process environment and how we can um, support you with um, gaining more advantage when you do, when you increase your safety. So from here Hi, back Marcus. to Volker for the rest. No, I'll um, I'll take over, Marcus. No problem at all. Yeah, this is this is not something to play with. This is uh, very serious, and the consequences can be uh, significant. So I highly, highly recommend uh, the uh, the handout uh, which is written around the API 2350 uh, that gives clear guidance and um, and direction as well. So thank you guys very much. Uh, in the handout, you can find some uh, some stuff to download. Uh, if you have any questions, please please uh, do not hesitate to ask them. We have some questions in the in the chat as well. Um, so if I can go through that, uh, Volker and Marcus. Um, yep. There were some very detailed questions as well, uh, and I suggest uh, we answer those uh, um, uh, offline. Maybe you can uh, take uh, uh, the opportunity to contact the the question answer and answer the answer online directly uh, uh, with that folder. But let me uh, let me ask uh, some of these questions, and especially the first question it's from Subair uh, on the bulging effect. Um, you know, you were showing that on the tank and with yourself a little bit, Volker. And um, the question now is, how much effect does it have on the accuracy of the measurement? So how does it influence the accuracy of my mass or volume that I have in the tank if I do not compensate for that or wrongly compensate for that? So basically, this is based on the level. You will have a zero to seven millimeters difference in the level readings. Now, you can overcome it with the correct 
linearization, for instance, or that you not fix your stilling well, your device to the tank roof. Because when the tank is moving up and down, the gauge reference heights will change. I have seen this unfortunately several times in the world that a customer fixed a stilling well or the device to the rooftop. And when it fills the tank, it was changing the gauge reference position. And then you get really this influences and that means your seven millimeters could be depending on the size of the tanks, 10,000 of liters, which you suddenly have or don't have in your pocket, depending on what time you trade it. Now, we can calculate that for you when we have your tank details. And therefore you do typically the right installation of the devices either close to the tank wall, then you have to look at the antenna and the beam angle. That's the reason why we have the 80 gigahertz or you use a stilling well, and you know how the stilling well with the steel knows how it's expanding, and then you can correct for it in the software. Yeah, you bring, uh, you bring up a very good point, Volker. Um, when you start um, upgrading your tanks or redesigning your tanks, or you're expanding your tank farm, please, please uh, get our people involved as soon, as soon as possible, because they can give you very, very good tips where to put what, and what the consequences are of not doing it right uh, for your accuracy and measurement. And sometimes these small changes, uh, if you do them up front, can be does not add any to the anything to the cost, uh, but it can have big influences on the accuracy and the performance of the system. So please get us involved there as soon as possible and let us help you. Then there's another question, uh, uh, a little bit related uh, to accuracy and measurement in tanks as well, Volker. And it has to do with the water bottom detection. Uh, I did not hear you say a lot about water bottom detection, but can you elaborate a little bit on water bottom detection in tanks? Yes, okay. And then there's another, we have two options. One bo water bottom sensor is connected to the temperature probe, and that is a capacitance probe. So, and uh, this de now depends how close you can go to the tank wall without influencing this capacitance field. Or we use a servo device which can measure the water interface level, the emulsion layer even, and you will just do it at one time. So when you define this typically in the night to make an automatic measurement. Right? Because I honestly don't hope that you constantly have water coming in into your tank. If that is the case, then we have some applications in Africa, where we have a server for continuously measuring the water interface level because it's changing. And at the same time, a second device, a radar, now it was a servo at that time, um, because that was the custom preference, um, measure purely the level. And when there's a certain water level inside, they're actually pumping it out. So it's required for continuous measurement. And this is a collection from many deep wells. So in there for sure you have lots of water coming in, which then will settle inside your tanks if you have forgotten to separate it already. And that is the life where we have to really look into the application, what we have to measure and how much we have to compensate for it. Do you, uh, can you give us some, some feel about how low can you go in measuring uh, water at the bottom? Okay, with the servo, um, that the height is 10, yeah, 10 centimeters, so we can go to five centimeters depending on the displacer. Mm -hmm. With the capacitance probe, we, we say typically uh, 200 centimeter above the tank bottom, there we would stop. And so, because it's not predictable then really, when you come to close, then you have to compensate it in the tank with the product inside, which is not so nice to do. Therefore, we rather, when we have to measure lower, we go with a servo device, yeah. because we can measure even to lower levels. But let me just tell you one thing, I have seen applications in tank where we had 12 meters water. 12 and meters. Only four, and only four meters oil. 
So yeah, sometimes it's a little bit tricky to have a device and we use a capacitance probe at a certain level to measure this one. It's an independent one. So it's a third device then which we have to use it because yep. it was had to be measured the whole time. Absolutely. Um, then we have some software questions, uh, very detailed software questions. I um, uh, suggest you get in contact with uh, uh, our customer there directly. And I got a question for you, Marcus. Um, the question is, can I use a second radar on the same tank to measure a high level alarm? Yes, you can do that. So the system is open that you can uh, use a radar also, a second radar. But as I said, um, also the regulations, the API are asking for diverse systems. So if you have a radar for tank gauging, you want to have something else, another measurement principle to, to measure the overfill or to, to make sure that you have an overfill for protection. There you could do a pro servo. But the easiest and the most cost efficient version here is the point level, the tuning fork, uh, where you can do that. But obviously you can also do this with a second radar. It's technically possible. Yeah, it's technically possible. But uh, uh, like you said, pointing out in the API 2350 as well, it's the uh, it's the not using the same technology uh, to come to the same point, uh, which is the, um, the biggest aspect. Okay. Yeah, I mean, why would you assume that if you do two times the same thing, you get a, a different output, um, you know, if one of the measurement it doesn't work like that? Absolutely. So I have, um, uh, let me see, I got a question. Um, what on the bulging issue, uh, again, uh, Volker, that bulging, that you did something with that bulging, I think. Yeah, sorry, I overcome too much weight. <laughs> yes. This is my age, you know, you bulge out and you enjoy the food. And since I'm married, I never lose my weight. Uh, a bad excuse, by the way. But um, <laughs> can you give us some remedy to overcome this bulging issue? Or is it only, can it only be solved by, by measuring the skin temperature and then can start compensating uh, based on uh, unknown information? No steel is not changing with temperature and overpressure. So you have to have the steel characteristic of your tank and you have to do a nice calibration of your tank linearization. Especially for this one, like our Chinese customers are using two linearization table, one based on level and one based on temperature so that they can overcome this even more closer. That is a local regulation. And that's part of a tank vision system. So yes, you have to use compensation with based on the steel and then have this verified with the laser calibration yeah. and with the steel measurement. Absolutely, that's the only way to do that. It's uh, it's uh, getting the information on the uh, on the steel and the and the measurement and then go from there. That's the only yeah. way to do it. Um, I have uh, one more question, and it's on OPC. Do you guys have an OPC output? Do we have an OPC output, Volker? Yes. Can you we have an OPC server for output is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, okay. You install an OPC server on your PC which will talk to our uh, tank vision system. And from there, you can get the data out, the calculated data and the information about the limits and bring it to your SCADA software. And do we have that? Yes, it's the part of the standard solution of yes. the tank vision. It's installed even, you can upload it from the tank vision and install it onto your PC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I know for many customers, they will use Modbus communication because they don't want a PC between for this action. Yeah, because if you use an OPC server and you have not installed this connection on a PLC, OPC connection, and you use a PC for that, and our OPC server is installed on a PC. Therefore, wow. we have the Modbus connection 
TCP or RS485 to do this direct signal integration into a control system. Perfect. Yeah. Last question. How long does it take for uh, um, a pro servo, a servo device to complete one full reading? So I assume it's going from all the way from the bottom to the top, including an interface, Volker. If you give me the tank height and the product inside and what you want to measure, I will calculate it for you. I just did today from remotely from my software a density profile for this tank behind me. And because I was only half filled, it took five minutes. So the density profile. And this tank behind me is only five meters. So that was selected to within five minutes, the density profile was done. Exactly. It's depending on how many points you take. And normally yeah. for a density profile, you make a lot of points at a lot of different heights in order to come yeah. to that profile. And if that takes only five minutes, it's uh, it's pretty fast. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, thank you, Volker. Thank you, Marcus, for your input. If you want to go through a whole uh, uh, process, yes, Volker, you want to say something? No, no, I wanted to get Matthias here. Ah, Mike. that's nice of you. <laughs> That's why I said, we have a very nice tour, an oil and gas virtual tour, where you see a lot of information on the uh, tank gauging and also on the overfill protection system, visualized on pictures and how all these processes link together. You see the uh, the link to that uh, video in the bottom of this uh, of uh, the slide in front of you. Uh, also, do not forget to get to the handouts uh, so you can. Um, uh, download that for future reference as well and i hope you had a good time we had a good time definitely i learned that there is a difference between the accent of a german and a swiss speaking english <laughs> that's what i learned definitely <laughs> no but seriously it was very good thank you very much next week new topic same time same place i hope to see you then again thank you very much and have a great day and with this i end this webinar Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.